Hello and welcome to this webinar. I'm Larry Boishumer. In this one, we are doing part one of our guide to help you choose the best network to connect your IoT devices to. This one covers the cellular-based networks, while part two will cover non-cellular options, including Wi-Fi, Ethernet, Bluetooth, and two new entrants, Sigfox and LoRa. Without further delay, on to the webinar. To get us started, here's a bit about me. I have been in the field of what is now called IoT for about 20 years, working in a variety of areas that has given me a unique exposure to assist people in their IoT journey. If I may, I encourage you to check out our weekly IoT podcast, The Internet of Things Made Simple, and you can check out hundreds of IoT-focused blogs at novatech.com blog. Now, I don't want to make this too much of a sales pitch. But I will say that Novatech has also been in the IoT space for about 20 years and is in a good place to help you with any aspect of your IoT journey. Now, without further delay, here is part one to your guide to picking the best IoT network for your application. No, it is not your imagination. There are way more choices than ever before. It used to be there was always a current latest and greatest network that was set up for smartphones or tablets, and IoT devices just piggybacked on that. While this is still the case for exciting networks like 4G and soon 5G, there are dedicated IoT networks that are optimized to maximize your experience while lowering down your costs. This will enable billions of devices to be connected, changing every aspect of our life. But what is the optimal network for you? There are a ton of factors. Connection speed, latency, and power consumption are three important ones, but local and international coverage, along with device availability, also need to be taken into account. We'll go through each of these options, point out five key things, some good, some bad, to outline the option, as well as to point out a few ideal applications for each one. Finally, network availability will play a key factor in your choice, and this has two similarities to the weather forecast. It tends to be very specific to your area, and it can change quickly. You'll want to ensure there is coverage in your desired area before purchase. Depending on where you live, you may view 2G very differently. In some parts of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, 2G may be the network that serves significant parts of where you live. For most other areas, 2G is starting to see its decline in usage so you really want to be careful in choosing 2G. Be sure you can get your devices activated on your network of choice. Assuming you can, here are five things you need to know about it. It is an extremely proven and battle-tested network technology, having been used for over a decade by millions of IoT devices. It provides a reliable platform for applications that do not feel the need for speed. More on that in a second. Virtually the entire world has 2G coverage, although some areas are starting to deactivate the technology. As of a few years ago, it was the only technology that you could be assured of to have blanketed coverage in most areas. It made its name by its ability to be used for tracking and monitoring. Tracking involves sending GPS location updates for devices, and monitoring involves sending usage and levels from key devices in the field. Those were definitely its strengths. On the negative side, besides tracking and monitoring, it didn't take much to top out speed on 2G. If you recall, the first iPhone was on 2G, and it was not a speedster for web-based traffic. It was fine for text and small messages, but forget sending live video feeds without annoyingly long buffering periods. Finally, in many parts of the world, it is time to say goodbye to the network that helped to fuel a lot of IoT's growth. I would not recommend using 2G for many areas of North America and Europe, and you'll want to do some significant research for deployments in all other areas. Assuming you find that coverage is not an issue, it is the only technology that can truly be considered for worldwide tracking applications. Your other option is to go into satellite, which we'll cover in part two of this series. A common application is security panels. Most panels either came with an embedded 2G module inside or were connected via low-cost 2G basic modems. If your device is at least a few years old and has embedded cellular technology, the chances are that it uses 2G. This is common in applications like utility sites and communication closets, as shown here in the picture. Finally, 2G was great for basic SCADA applications. For those of you who are rusty on your IoT acronyms, 
SCADA stands for Supervisory Control in Data Acquisition. So, to explain easily, take a parking gate. The SC, or Supervisory Control part, would let you lift the gate by sending a command, and the DA, or Data Acquisition part, would let you know how many cars went by. The next network technology that we're going to talk about is 3G. This was the network that started the explosive growth of the smartphone, and it's still running strong in many parts of the world. Many parts of rural North America still fall back to 3G. 3G offered a big jump over 2G in terms of speed, and that opened up a number of key applications. It also lowered down the latency, making it more applicable for applications that were sensitive to it. It's not 5G speeds, but it's pretty quick for most applications. Like 2G, it has a pretty extensive worldwide footprint. Virtually all industrialized countries are blanketed in 3G coverage, and many second and third world nations have at least urban centers covered with 3G. One interesting development of 3G was how it introduced MMS, or multimedia messaging. So thank it for the craze of watching YouTube clips sent by your friends. While it offered a great platform for many IoT applications, it did use a significant amount more power than 2G devices, meaning that it was not optimized for battery-based deployments. It is not a full-blown power hog, but you may wish to consider this if power usage needs to be at a minimum. Finally, although it's not as far down the path of leaving as 2G, it may be time to say goodbye to 3G in most areas. It is becoming increasingly difficult to load a net new 3G device onto carriers in North America, so be sure to do your research before choosing 3G. Assuming coverage and network availability is not an issue, one application that it was always great for was digital signage. The nature of a digital sign is that it's mostly a monitoring application, monitoring for things like burnt light bulbs, and only in the off hours is new material sent. 3G was optimal for this. If you are in North America, Cat1 may also be a great alternative, which we'll cover in a few slides. Basic field force automation sounds complex, but it's really not. It combines GPS tracking to locate your work vehicles, as well as allowing your team to look up work orders, bring down safety documents and blueprints, and to alert if there's an issue. Because of its widespread coverage, and the fact that it could fall back to 2G in most cases, it still may be a great choice. Utility monitoring was often done using 2G, and in many cases, this was sufficient. However, some of the applications have requirements to send down quick updates and commands, and 3G's lower latency was preferred. Out-of-band management is a very underutilized application. Many IT teams want to move the management of their key routers away from being done locally in the event of a break-in. For years, POTS dial-in lines were used, but many have been replaced with cellular gateways. 3G offered enough speed to be used for that application, as well as to provide a viable backup in the event that the mainline became unavailable. 3G has had a great life, but is now starting the gradual slide towards obsolescence in many areas of the world, so be sure to do your homework before choosing it. The first of the two speedster networks that we're going to cover, 4G, is blazingly fast. It offers an incredible platform to use for a variety of applications and is currently the fastest network available commercially today. If your deployment is happening in 2019 and you have speed as your main factor, this is where you need to look. So how fast is it? Just watch all the kids downloading YouTube videos on the bus to see that it's sufficient to replace a high-speed connection for most applications. It is great at video, such as video conferencing, as it has a fairly low level of latency one that is much better than 3G. As it is the network that carries a push for their smartphones for the past few years, there has been a lot of work to be done to make sure it works well while mobile. Its speeds in a mobile environment, as well as its stability, is very impressive. 4G's performance is one of the reasons why you need to reach for your power cord on your iPhone or Android device more often, as its performance comes at a cost of using more power. Many IoT applications are more power conscious, making 4G a bad choice. The other main issue with 4G is cost. If you're putting a 4G module into a $1,000 smartphone, the cost of the module is not prohibitive. However, if you're building a tracking device, its cost premium over other technologies was not justified, especially since you didn't benefit from the extra speed. In terms of applications, 
public safety agencies loved 4G. It offered sufficient speed to allow workers to download documents like mugshots and blueprints while being able to fall back to 3G in rural areas. Mobile retail is a widespread application. It may mean moving outside into the parking lot. It may mean the store having seasonal offerings in an area like a nursery. It could be a food truck or it could be temporary retail at a trade show. In any case, 4G offered more than enough speed for transactions, inventory lookup, and more. Transit and trains used to 4G saw explosive growth over the last few years. The available speed offered enough bandwidth to track buses, process payments, as well as to offer Wi-Fi to passengers as a way to attract more people to ride the bus. Finally, disaster recovery applications need speed, but just as importantly, they need quick setup. They have been big users of cellular-based technology. 4G offered enough bandwidth to run an entire command center while falling back to older technologies in more rural areas. In short, 4G is the current speed leader. And until the next generation makes its long-anticipated debut, it has a very long life ahead of it and is a great choice for those looking for a lot of speed. If you truly feel the need to go supersonic, however, check out the next choice. And here it is, 5G. Welcome to the bullet train of cellular technologies. There has been talk for a decade about how people would truly cut the cord at home and in the office and opt for cellular-based communication. That was kind of tough to do in the past, but 5G will make it a reality for millions. To start, I'm running out of adjectives to describe its speed. I'm now just calling it stupid fast, but for a reason. Its initial launch speed will be faster than most people have at their home and office, so that's what makes it appealing. However, its ability to grow to hundreds of times faster than 4G begs a question, who needs that? That's why I'm calling it stupid fast as it is so fast that I don't think anyone needs that speed for a long time. The other main gain over 4G is its lower latency. Applications like mobile surgery are a distinct possibility as the latency is as close to real time as we've ever seen in a wireless network. It is so fast, it will truly eliminate buffering in most video applications. The final benefit is capacity. Every cellular technology optimized the use of the radio waves better than its predecessor allowing for more users to share the same infrastructure. 5G takes that to the next level, allowing for up to 1 million users per square mile, which is staggering. Okay, sounds perfect, right? Well, not quite. This performance comes at a cost in a couple of ways. Its components are multiple times more than any other network, making it difficult to justify for most IoT applications. It is also very heavy in the power usage department, making it the gas guzzler of cellular technologies. Still, smartphone manufacturers are racing to get out 5G phones in 2019, but you should not rush to buy one. Most areas will not see optimized 5G coverage in 2019. So if you're buying a 5G phone this year, you'll spend an awful lot of time on 4G networks. So assuming you have coverage and are willing to pay for the premium that 5G brings, what application will benefit from 5G's incredible capabilities? The first is autonomous cars. The average self-driving car will transmit up to 1,000 times what the average person does in a year, and much of its traffic is time-sensitive. It will use all the capabilities of 5G wherever it's available. As mentioned, most expect that 5G will cause a lot of homeowners and business owners to cut their wire connection. This means if you are building a business or residential landline replacement product, like a gateway, 5G needs to be on your radar. Okay, I think I would still prefer to have a surgeon look over me when they operate, like in this picture. However, if you are remote and getting to a hospital is not a viable option, 5G offers a platform to make mobile surgery and real-time healthcare a true possibility for the first time. Finally, 5G will change the entertainment space dramatically. Its speeds, capacity, and lower latency will accelerate the growth of technologies like AR and VR and will allow for real-time interactive games like Fortnite to be played in virtual real-time anywhere you want, thanks to its real-time nature. Cat1 is the first IoT-focused network that we're going to talk about. It is kind of the Goldilocks of IoT networks. It offers a decent level of data speed, enough for not only tracking applications, but to transfer a significant amount of data when needed. However, it offers a low enough level of power consumption to make it a viable option for many mobile-based applications. It is also the slowest network 
that fully supports two-way voice communications. Still, it doesn't get the respect it deserves, as many opt for speed demons like 4G or 5G, or lower capacity options that we're going to cover shortly, like CAD-M. This is a shame. This is a consideration that most people should look at. As mentioned, it's ideal for two-way voice communication, like in the case of intercoms and alarm systems. For the vast majority of IoT applications, it offers plenty of throughput speed. This makes it an ideal balance for those applications that want to maximize battery life, but still feel the need to push down quick updates. Unlike 5G, which currently has little or no coverage, most areas of North America are well covered by Cat1 networks today, making it an ideal choice for most deployments. It also has a long life ahead of it. Its main flexibility is also one of its main issues. It's really not great at anything. It's also not bad at anything. But most people tend to flock towards one of the extremes, as I mentioned. They want that speed from 4G or 5G or the extremely long battery life. CAT1 doesn't excel at either, so many people push it aside. Finally, the big growth in 4G means there is no shortage of hardware available for that network. The same is expected on the low battery side for CAT-M as 2019 progresses. CAT-1 does have a number of options, but if you're looking for a very specific choice, the selection might not be as great. Still, it is ideal for many applications, including voice-based mobile applications. Most people overlook voice, considering that people are using text and Instagram more than ever. But many applications, like wearables that help find our loved one, benefit from the addition of voice on board. The next application is mobile healthcare monitoring, as in the picture. While this could be done using 4G or even CAT-M, CAT-1's balance of cost versus speed make it a much better choice for this application. Similarly, digital signage is a perfect application for CAT-1 and should be your choice, assuming that 3G is not a viable option for you. It provides you with a lower hardware option cost, but one that's capable of downloading you new content quite quickly. Finally, there are ATMs and kiosks. Like digital signage, they may be able to work in many cases on a CAT-M network, as they are not necessarily that data-heavy in applications. However, these devices may need to do quick firmware updates in many cases, so the extra cost for a CAT-1 device over a CAT-M device is kind of easy to justify. While CAT-1 might be the Goldilocks of network choices, it offers a very flexible platform more than most people realize, and it should be on your radar often more likely than it is. While 5G has received the most media attention, CAT-M may be the network that is most anticipated in the world of IoT, and for good reason. By taking out what you don't need, lower latency, and high data throughput speed, it will become the default standard for most IoT applications in 2019 and beyond. By taking out the speed and offering a higher latency, this allowed designers to remove a lot of components that are not required. This offers a few benefits, the first being low power usage. When you have a lower usage of power, this allows you to use a smaller battery or extend the battery life, lowering cost and the overall size of the unit. The second benefit to less components is a smaller footprint. Although some manufacturers may choose to keep the cellular module for CAT-M the same size as other technologies for contingency sake, others will reduce the size, allowing it to fit into smaller designs than ever before, maximizing its appeal. I don't want to make it sound like it's only optimal for text-based traffic, although I would highly recommend not watching YouTube videos over a CAT-AM connection. It does offer enough bandwidth to upload reports and to send down firmware updates as needed, just not as fast as other technologies. It has two big issues to it, however, depending on your needs and your timelines. The first is the very high latency that I referred to, or the time it takes to send data in a loop. It is definitely the ground option if you were to compare it to a courier company. As long as you are okay with the extra time it takes to send and receive data, this might not be an issue. The other issue in 2019 may be the coverage. Although carriers have been working quickly to deploy the network everywhere, it may not have optimal coverage in all places in 2019, especially in rural areas and some in building systems. However, since it's very easy for the carriers to deploy, this may not be an issue for too long. The first kind of application that CAT-M is going to see very heavy use for is in the wearable and personal tracker space. Most people using these devices are not likely to be heavy data users, and most data is not extremely time sensitive. 
Even if it's used for a panic alarm, it may cause only an extra couple seconds of delay, which is not a deal breaker in most cases. If it is, 4G or 5G might be warranted. The next application is for heavy equipment monitoring. While some devices may produce a lot of data, many companies will not feel the need to transmit all of it wirelessly, but instead will just be looking for updates on key readings and locations, something that CAT-M is optimized for. The term environmental systems is quite broad, as it can refer to monitoring things like the pH level of a river, the light level of a baseball stadium, or the level of ice on a roadway. In any of these cases, plus many, many more, CAT-M offers the perfect balance. Finally, most fleet operators are looking at CAT-M based solutions to replace existing 3G solutions, as it allows for a lower overall cost and improved battery usage without sacrificing performance. In short, CAT-M is set to become the dominant North America IoT network in 2019, and if you don't need a lot of speed and are okay with longer latency than in 4G, it definitely should be on your radar. The final cellular network option is one that seems to have a lot of secrecy as to its availability. So while it should be on your mid to long term radar, you need to do a lot of research and that is NB-IoT or NB-1. Once available, it has the potential to open up tens of billions of IoT devices and applications that might not have been financially feasible before, even using a low cost technology like CAD-M. While CAD-M is low power, NB1 looks to be even lower, lengthening the time between charges for power-sensitive applications. While I have not yet seen pricing, the early indication are that modules and gateways will be the lowest cost of any technology, so stay tuned. While we will cover Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in Part 2, they have a strong position for many applications that are based in the home, in the office, or where the device uses your smartphone for communications. The low cost of both components and connectivity for MB IoT means that it becomes a viable alternative for many companies to use cellular technology in many applications. No technology is perfect for every application, and MB IoT or MB1 definitely has its limitations. As mentioned, it is extremely slow. It has even longer latency times than CAT M, and unlike CAT M, it is not recommended for use in a mobile environment, fixed only. The other drawback is that depending on where in the world you are, there may be limited or no coverage, so do your research before you go down this path. Assuming you have coverage, the first application that screams out for MBIoT is what's referred to as industrial machine monitoring. The lower cost and battery needs will bring down the cost of deployment, opening up the addressable market for IoT by tens of billions of devices that it now might make financial sense to monitor. Similarly, its low power use makes it ideal for energy monitoring applications like remote oil wells and pipelines. Many devices that companies want to monitor do not have power, like fencing at a construction site where a company might want to know if it's moved. The low cost of a battery operated device in the past using cellular was way too high to make financial sense, but this will change with MBIoT in most cases. Finally, companies often wanted to monitor a single variable at a location like the temperature of a key storage space. Installing a gateway for a single sensor often made little sense, but it was required to bring back the information. MBIoT allows for the use of standalone sensors, often eliminating the gateway and opening up potentially trillions of sensors that could be monitored using cellular-based technology. Yes, I said trillions. Here are all of the networks with their approximate score on four key categories outlined. Do remember, the difference in some of these things may be very wide on some, and the difference may be less on others. As an example, the difference in power usage, while it may be big between 5G and MBIoT, it's not like you need to build a nuclear power plant to power a 5G connection. However, in many applications, it is a factor in your deployment. The first consideration is data speed. You need to determine what you need for speed, not just on a day-to-day -day use, but what might you need during a time of heavy use, and what flexibility do you want to have in your deployment. If your plan is to one day stream live video from a site, the choice of CADM now would mean you have to upgrade much sooner than before. In terms of network latency, most applications are not that sensitive, meaning that if it takes a few extra seconds to send key pieces of information, it will not change the overall performance. 
However, this is not the case for applications like video surveillance, which may see a lot of undesired buffering on slow connections. Power use often matters by how you are powering the device. A cellular module may use the majority of power in some mobile devices, but it's not even noticeable if it's used in a high power device like an HVAC unit. Generally, devices powered by AC are not as power conscious, where devices powered by battery tend to put more of an emphasis on lower power use. Finally, like power use, cost may or may not be an issue, depending on the overall cost of the deployment. Some devices that use cellular connectivity cost tens of thousands of dollars. And although companies are always looking to take even the smallest bit of margin out, the cost of a module is not a huge factor in the overall price of the device. This is not the case for mobile trackers, where the cellular module may be the single biggest cost. It is important to remember before we leave this slide that you are not limited to a single technology. Most companies use multiple technologies depending on the needs of a particular deployment. Depending on your hardware choice, the move from one technology to another might also be very seamless as well. As a reminder, these are only half of the choices that you have for connecting your IoT devices. In part two, we will cover well-known network choices like Ethernet, Bluetooth, and Wi-Fi, lesser-known choices like Sigfox and LoRa, and we will also cover satellite and private radio, which have a long history of use in many industrial and remote applications. Yes, you're finally done. Many thanks for taking time out of your busy day to learn more about IoT networks. We look forward to you joining us for part two. Novatech is a great place to start your IoT journey. We have a lot of great material on our webpage, offer industry-leading service and expertise, and have local presence through our vast reseller network. I also ask you follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Many thanks. Take care.